For far too long, Africa has lived through a history of slavery, theft, foreign rule, and the darkest place in human history that the world brought to her doorstep. 400 years later, Africa's curse have birthed a dynamic, onward, and rising people. Join the Inspire e-conference 2021 as great minds edify on the positioning of the new rising star. Starting on the 9th to the 14th of August, Africa, get ready. My name is Elizabeth Okello, and I'm going to be your host for this uh, part of the evening. And I must say, welcome. Welcome from wherever you are. We are delighted to have you with us. Uh, without wasting a lot of time, uh, this session is, uh, it is, we have a theme for this session, and that is investment in health our greatest wealth. And I must say we are privileged to have uh, a team of experts, a team of health experts with us who are going to be taking us through to digest this theme and tell us a little bit more about what it is. And uh, this is how we're going to do it. We will have the, all the four panelists be able to take us through, give us some insights uh, from their different areas of expertise on the theme and then we'll be able to have a discussion, but please do not forget that uh, we will have breakout sessions after this, so you can be able to ask a lot more questions, interact with our team after we have ended officially the sessions. So thank you very much. And uh, please do not forget to, to share your highlights with those who may not be here on Twitter, on Facebook, and be able to share uh, what is it that is uh, standing out for you as you listen in to our speakers this evening? Thank you very much. And I'm going to quickly go straight to introduce. We have four panelists, and I'm going to introduce our first panelist who is going to, to share with us his insights. And uh, this is none other, Dr. Geoffrey. Geoffrey Musinguzi, he's a fellow at Macquarie University School of Public Health in the Department of Disease Control and Environmental Health. Dr. Musinguzi holds a postdoctorate research position in the Department of Primary and Interdisciplinary Care at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. He also holds a Doctor of Medical Science from the University of Antwerp and a Master of Medical Science with a major in Public Health from Lund University in Sweden. His first degree is Bachelor of, of Environmental Health Science from Macquarie University, and his academic and research interest is epidemiology of HIV and cardiovascular disease risk factors in the community and uh, preparedness of health systems. He's also involved in teaching and academic supervision of both undergraduate, graduate students at Macquarie University School of Public Health. Dr. Musinguzi is an academic editor, member of the Public Library of Science editorial board. He's also a reviewer for several international journals, including the Journal of Clinical Hypertension. And uh, this is the gentleman who is going to share with us together with a team of others that will come shortly. So Dr. Geoffrey Musinguzi, over to you to share with us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for such a wonderful introduction. What a great opportunity to be on this platform. Uh, a big challenge for Eunice, who has eloquently presented herself and having a, a background in academia and then going in into business. She talked about spices in food. I'll, of course, talk about spices, not food, but cardiovascular prevention. So as I start, let me try to share my video uh, just shortly. And then, um, thank you so much you have ably introduced me and uh, the title we are focusing on with my colleagues who will be following really is invest investment in health, our greatest wealth. Uh, if you look at my title, I said, is it? So of course the audience will be able to let us know whether it really investment in health is their greatest wealth or really many other areas take a lot of their focus. Elizabeth, I haven't seen my slide, but I'll be going on probably to come through. Um, uh, a quick introduction of myself. I'm a Christian, born again. I've been, uh, I've been uh, moving with Christ for quite some time since I was a young 
boy now grown with great responsibility. I'm a father. Um, I'm a father. I'm a husband of one wife. I'm a researcher. Of course, I'm an academic editor. There is a particular slide of interest which I wanted, but I think sharing has failed, which was a practical session that I wanted um, uh, members to, to be able to, to go through. But you can see go we, we through. We will have it in a minute. Yeah, we will okay. have it in a minute. Just go on. Oh, that would be very wonderful if you can really have it in a minute. So uh, as I did say, my area of interest is cardiovascular health risk factor and prevention of cardiovascular disease. I'm sure all of you might be having a pen before you and a piece of paper. You probably might be having maybe a, a phone, whatever it is. So there are these particular risk factors that I want you to either put the number you see there or put a zero. Excellent. So we are there. Slide number three, Elizabeth, is what I'm interested in. Number three, that one there. So if you have a pen, the first factor smoking two packs of cigarette a day. If you do, put an eight. If you don't, put a zero. And the second factor drinking alcohol three or more ounces a week. This two, uh, three ounces is about 28 grams. If you do, put a 10. If you don't, put a zero. Over, over eating more than 2,500 calories per day. I know in Africa, it's not always common for us to measure but just assuming you think you really overeat and um, uh, you put a five, but if you think you don't overeat, you can put a zero or you can leave it if you think it doesn't apply to you. Eating too much fat in your diet, uh, this could be pork, this could be uh, ghee, it could be butter or anything. If you think you really take a lot of this, put a five. If you don't, put a zero. Eating lots of sugar. If you think you take a lot of sugar, put an eight. If you don't, put a zero not exercising at least three times a week. And this exercising is about 30 minutes. Uh, every time you exercise, about 30 minutes. That means about three times a week, you can put a 10 if you don't. But if you do, put a zero. Uh, being overweight, if you consider yourself overweight, we measure overweight uh, using what we call a body mass index or waist hip ratio. But if you think you are overweight, put a 10. If you're not, put a zero. Uh, having lots of stress in your life. If you really think you have a lot of stress in your life, put a seven. If you don't, you can put a zero. So at the end of it, or you can do an aggregate. Don't send me the answers because I don't need them. But I also have a case scenario here of one of my, uh, my case uh, person here who almost goes for all these risk factors. So they actually have a sixth risk score. Uh, below it, you can see a number line from birth to 90 or to 100. So let's assume your life expectancy. Uh, for me, the life expectancy for the person here, uh, they wish life for them to, this person to live is 100 years. So this, what you, these numbers stand in for risk factor, loss, years of life lost when you practice certain behaviors. For example, smoking cigarette regularly uh, will lead you to lose about 80 years of life. So if I add all, I would say 100 minus 63, the person who was supposed to live 100 years ends up living around 37 years. So I'm sure if the life expectancy for Uganda is maybe 60, you can do the same, remove the, risk, the risks you have been able to get, and then you can know where you stand. That takes me back to my question, is it really health our greatest investment or not? Uh, we can go on, Elizabeth, the next slide, and then we go into a further discussion on this. Keep your answers to yourself. That was really intended to trigger you. So what happens is that most of these risk factors, as you can see, physical inactivity, alcohol consumption, tobacco, and the rest, are taking root in Africa. They are really taking deep root in Africa. And they take as they go deep into the society, they flourish by actually uh, releasing some of these non-communicable diseases, the diabetes that are increasing, the cancers that we are seeing, the heart diseases we are seeing, the chronic lung diseases, and among many other factors. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so as they take root, uh, you can, yes, uh, we realize it takes us to what we call the illness wellness paradigm. This was conceived by a man called uh, John Travis. He, uh, he, he, in fact, he had just finished his clinicals in Baltimore. And then he realized when the rest had left, that's when he conceived this. So he realized that there is a treatment paradigm and the treatment paradigm, that's when you actually feel sick. You get malaria, you run because you develop signs, you, you develop symptoms, and then you run to the hospital, go, get treatment. 
uh, or any other sickness that is uh, uh, clearly presenting with challenges to you. But then you realize that beyond that treatment paradigm, there is the wellness paradigm that starts from even a state of ill health to a state of high level of wellness. So you realize that many, I mean, using this simple um, wellness paradigm, illness wellness paradigm, many of the people are operating below the wellness midpoint. The treatment paradigm help us reach the neutral point where there is no discernible illness or wellness. And the moment that is it, we are actually comfortable. But in reality, there are risk factors as we have seen that slowly eat us up. And in the process, when the cancer presents, Okay, it's after a long time of exposure. I can go to my next slide. Um, so, uh, yes. So these are just uh, trends, uh, projected trends of selected profiles. I chose obesity and blood pressure uh, for the period 20, 2000 to 2025. And the dotted line shows the target we need to meet. There are global targets which we are set. But however, if you could look at our trend from the data coming in from the WHO NCD profile for Uganda, our obesity trend is going high. Our blood pressure trend is also going high. So you can go to the next slide, Elizabeth. So that's what we really observe. So remember, we are talking about the root causes and what brings about this. From the work we are doing in Mukono and Wikwe, of course, this is uh, hospital data. We see, see some of these trends. Uh, what we see, of course, in a week where it's a downward trend, not because the cases are going down, but just simply because of our sicasty or our inability to be able to, to regularly take screenings of, so for some of these basic conditions. Let's go to the next screen. I'm trying to be mindful of time. So what is health? The most classic definition of health is actually that of WHO, 1948, and C stands to this date a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. When we go back uh, to our illness uh, wellness model, we tend to define, in most cases, health based on infirmity or disease. But this definition is so broad, it takes into consideration the mental health, the social health, and the physical health. So health must cover the physical, the mental, emotional health, as well as social health. If any of these, Elizabeth, you can be taking me to the, my next slide, gets skewed or is given less attention, what happens is that you get your uh, triangle flip-flopping. So it can be loop-sided, meaning that you cannot be fully healthy when this triangle is actually not what? complete. So all sides, it's our response. We try as much as possible to work and keep these sides balanced. Your physical health, you need to work on it. And there are many things you do to keep your physical health. For example, exercising or physical activity, talk about eating, uh, 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 eating a proper or healthy diet, uh, talk about uh, is having enough sleep and so forth. But also your mental health, you need to work on it actually. And there are some active things you can do actually to ensure that your mentally, your mental health is catered for, but also social health defined by how we go about with others. So we don't need this flip-flopping, but we are not always in total control of these triangles. That takes us to our next slide, um, Elizabeth. So in the next slide, we see the broader determinants of health. Uh, around 2003, uh, WHO commissioned, um, uh, I think it was the Mammoth, the Michael Mammoth report to go and find out what are the broader determinants, the social determinants of health. Michael Mammoth and his team in 2008 published a report and they came up with specific recommendations. The title of the report was Closing the Gap in a Generation, Health Equity Through Action on the Social Determinants of Health. Me and you know, when, uh, the report was published in 2008. This is 2021. You and me can agree whether we have actually closed the gap or actually the gap has come wider. And I think the pandemic can actually tell us more about this. So some of these reports can come through, international reports, but they clearly tell us that they can be well written, but in reality, they trickle into the recommendations. And I think the theme for this conference is such an excellent theme that Africa get ready. So when you look at the specific 
recommendation improve daily living conditions. This is a broader determinant and as it doesn't only determine non-communicable diseases, but also determines communicable diseases or infectious diseases. Tackle the iniquity, inequitable distribution of power, money and resources. If we talk of the index, uh, the, the gene index in, in Africa, that's why we find very huge the rich, the poor is very poor. So those differences were recommended to be tackled, measure and understand the problem, assess the impact of action. So I'm not going to the detail of this, but shows the broader determinants, water, sanitation, housing, and so forth. All those factors will determine how we, 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 how we balance on the try, we balance the triangle. We can go to the next slide, uh, Elizabeth. Um, now, in the next slide, uh, after looking at these broader determinants, why should we really invest in health? Investing in health saves lives. We need health to make wealth. When we are not wealthy, when we are not healthy, for sure it's very difficult to be wealth. Individuals, families, communities, and governments all have got a role to play. Sometimes we say it's the government responsibility. Yes, government has got responsibility, but we also as individuals, we have responsibility over our health. Ill health in, it impairs productivity, hinders job prospects, and adversely affects human capital development. I'm sure some of you might have been to some places where people actually ask you for a medical exam, and then you give that report. Ask yourself why. Just because you are looking for health people to be able, because you are sure when people are very healthy, they're actually going to be very productive. Essential cost-effective health services should be accessible to the poorest in society to improve productivity and avoid impoverishment. When you have very poor society, we actually suffer. Crime increases. And of course, the demand on the resources you may have when you're rich can be so high. It's very difficult as a Christian to see your neighbor suffering and then you remain, you know, uh, excelling in health, in wealth. Health and well-being are essential in fostering, in, 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 in fostering economic development, poverty reduction, and overall social cohesion at the various levels of society. So investment in health is a call for all of us. Let's go to the next slide, Elizabeth. Um, so I just wanted to say, what's our contribution? What is our small contribution? You know, uh, Eunice asked a very, pertinent question, what is your burden for Africa? Uh, as you had in, my introdu in the introduction, I work both for uh, Makere University, but also for the University of Antwerp, uh, largely on the same project, SPICES, which is scaling up packages of interventions for cardiovascular disease prevention in Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe. I was so much requested to remain in Europe, but I say, no, I need to be based in Uganda, so I'm able to do the implementation of this project. I benefited out of it from the community of Mukona and Wiko, and I felt I needed to give back. So we are implementing a cascade of CVD prevention, starting from the household to the community, to the primary health care level. At the primary health care level, we are targeting health center threes, the health center fours, and the district hospitals. Then, of course, the community, we are targeting community health workers, and then, of course, the household members. Let's go to the next slide. Um, now, the specific activities, what are we doing at health facilities? We realize that most of the, uh, the, the training, uh, medical training is skewed towards infectious and maternal health conditions. These NCDs are largely, you know, a newcomer on the table. So the interest has actually been low. So from the assessment we did from healthcare workers, we there was a huge gap in basic management of these chronic conditions. So we'd say to, uh, to, to deliver an eight day modular program to on-site program to health facilities. So these pictures are just illustrating some of the different facilities, health center threes in Mukono, health center fours in Mukono and the district uh, facilities, actually both in Mukono and Wiko. Let's go to the next slide. And these are various uh, places we have been able to visit and train. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so in our next slide, it uh, shows our cycle one and the cycle two training activities. We felt like there was need for us to train at health facilities 
uh, because to be more costly, we are looking for cost effective intervention, to be more costly to bring people into the workshop. But also on the other hand, we know human resource capacity is very limited in these facilities. So we train the healthcare workers after they have actually done their work in the afternoon from, from two to actually five. So in total, uh, before the lockdown, we had trained 13 health facilities and in two different cycles. Cycle one, we trained 163 and full attendance was 74, giving us a 48% uh, completion. Cycle two, after learning lessons, we are able to improve completion to 72. And we realized that it was important to disseminate and keep in constant touch with the trainees, be able to learn and gain and work together with them. So that, lay, that learn help us to actually improve. Let's go to the next slide. But also working with the local support was extremely important. So uh, next slide, Elizabeth, was very, very important in our programming. We continue to deliver this uh, within Mukona and Wikwe. I can say that COVID-19, has really been a problem to us. Next slide, I can't see the next slide, but the next slide uh, focuses on um, equipping these facilities exactly. So data is power. We realize that most of these uh, health center threes, they were using paper-based data, but we realize that it's a huge challenge for us to track some of these conditions. So we actually equip them with different uh, tools, computers, diagnostic tools. From the community study we conduct, we realized that up to 40, only 40%, 40 for example, say they have never had hypertension assessment or diagnosis or screening done. So we felt like basic screenings were actually required. So we offer these basic tools to all these primary healthcare facilities. And I'm happy to say that uh, the government approach towards the, the parish level is such an excellent approach because that's where the people are. Some people would leave, for example, uh, Mpunge, a village a little bit far to the lakeside to go to Mukono, but the cost of transport to go for, for example, a glucose test to try to find out whether they actually have high blood sugar or don't, or, or to go for a blood pressure measurement. So we felt that that was a huge gap. These things are not very expensive. So we have been working close with the district health, uh, health team to be able to have these at the level of health center threes and the level of health center four, so that care is cascaded from the health center three to the health center four and then to the, to, to the, to the district hospitals. We can go to the next uh, slide, um, please. Yes, so this shows just a bit of some of those facilities we have been able to equip desktop computers. And this is before the lockdown, by the way. 13 were facilitated, uh, 13 facilities, but only 10 received. Now, the biggest challenge we have also had is that uh, some facilities don't have electricity and we cannot, of course, provide that. So they will miss a computer because they are not connected to a grid. So we have these stadiometers, measurement tapes, glucometer and strips, thermal printers we are also pro provided. Let's go to the next slide. I'm being cognizant of time to see that we finish in time. Now, digitalizing data at health facilities is such a fantastic thing. It has not only changed, uh, the, you know, it has not only uh, impacted healthcare workers, but also the community that benefit. Now, we had one gap. We would do the data screening on the computer, but then we had nothing. Thing we are giving to the patient. So that was a huge gap. Let's go to the next slide uh, to be able to, to, to show you some bit of innovation back because the patients were being screened, but then they would actually live on time passing along the street on Kampala. I actually, yes, uh, uh, you see, this, 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 this is actually uh, like uh, when you are in a street parking, they, I think, then they give you a receipt. I realize this is a small piece of paper very cheap so i asked the, the it team can't we actually integrate something of this kind into uh into our uh, into our screening activities in mkona and wake interesting that the it team picked it up so if you show in the next slide you'll actually realize that we are now able to print uh results for our clients in these facilities to be able to see what results they have received and to be able to go along so it has revol revolutionized healthcare facilities at that level. But on the other hand, I also have to so say, if you can go to the next slide, Elizabeth, sorry, the heights, I think the slides are heavy. Now, it has also actually increased interest and patient-seeking behavior. So on the left, you'll actually see 
that is our small printer. We use very small uh, uh, rolls of papers. And then on the rest, I'm actually just displaying one of the printout, displaying the patient result. So this has actually been excellent. Of course, we have some challenges in terms of power, in terms of human resource, but this is an implementation science research. So we actually keep improving. Let's go to the next slide. I'm actually coming to the end almost. Um, so in the next slide, we are also intervening at the community, community health care workers. We train them to be able to deliver at the household level. So that's one of the sessions. The next slide. So these community health workers are given a seven-day comprehensive training, including a practicum. So when they go to the communities, actually they go house to house to be able to train uh, household members on the, on the broad range of cardiovascular risk. If you see at the back of their T-shirt, there are the different basic questions I asked in the beginning, alcohol, physical activity, overweight. And then the next slide, which is not coming through, is about the visits we make in these homes by the community health workers. And the slide that comes after that is about the benefit. Yes, this one here. Now, health is wealth. Because we educated community members who grow vegetables, increase their food consumption. What we are seeing in that slide, when we visited this particular home, the lady gave us uh, uh, vegetables to show that what you taught me, I comprehended it. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, now, the next slide is showing us some of the impact responses that have actually, yes, uh, this is the community. Let's go to the next slide because I want to finish. I see time has gone through. This is all community intervention, empowering groups within those communities. And then uh, this is the broader team, including inter interventions here in Uganda, in South Africa, in the UK, as well as in Belgium. And then the next slide after that shows us that the, one of the blogs of one of the person in terms of impact. If you go past that slide, shows us one of the blogs. Yes, Spices Project improving NCD health centers and impacting community uh, championing community transformation. So that's what we are really doing and contributing to the well being of the people in our country. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'll stop there and then allow others also to participate. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Joffrey Mosinguzi. And I must say, for the listeners out there, CVD is cardiovascular disease. I could see someone typing in there, but thank you very much and uh, for sharing with us your expertise. And we are grateful for that project that you are doing in Mukono and Uyikwe. We are hopeful that this will spiral into the rest of Africa so that we could have similar of these all over. What we hope and envisage for the whole of Africa is to see that this is uh, displayed all over across the continent. Thank you very much, Dr. Musinguzi. We are delighted that you could share with us in your story and uh, we thank God for what you are doing.